Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Welcome back, everybody, to another amazing episode of For the Love of Money. I am out of my mind excited for today's episode because I get to sit down with one of my good friends, Kyle Maynard. Now, obviously, Kyle needs no introduction. I'm sure all of you have seen him and heard of him already. But in case you've been like, I don't know, living under a rock or something like that, Kyle is the quadruple amputee who you see on TV all the time, on stages all the time. He's a motivational speaker. He is the New York Times bestselling author of the book, No Excuses. You know, even though he grew up and was born without arms at the end of his elbows and without legs where his knees are, he continued to play football, become a champion wrestler, win an ESPN ESPY award. And are you ready for this? He climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Yes. Mind-blowing, right? So you can only imagine the conversations that we're about to have in this episode of overcoming any limiting beliefs and factors and going out there and literally summiting whatever it is that you want to summit. You know, he's also a business expert because he speaks on stage 50 to 100 times per year. So he knows exactly what makes people successful and what will also hold people back from success. Matter of fact, we actually talk about really important advice on one thing that will make you in business and one thing that will break you in business. And at the end, you're going to love hearing about the creative ways that he makes impact for the causes that mean the most to him. So get ready, listen up, because this episode is absolutely moving, touching, and valuable. All right, Kyle, my friend, how you doing? I've been so freaking excited to have you on. Doing awesome, man. It's a uh, it's an honor to be able to talk after you kind of told me just your story and all of that, and just connecting the dots and all all of that. What probably two years ago at Lewis's event now, something like that. Yeah. So what the audience doesn't know is you and I go way back, way further back. than you knew. So you know, here I was in corporate America in banking years and years and years. We're talking like more than a decade ago, and you know, this guy comes in and he speaks to us about no excuses. He speaks to us about you can accomplish whatever you want. And, and of course, you know, he's, his arms are cut off at the, the elbows and his, his legs are cut off at the, um, the knees. And I remember being so damn inspired. I felt like I could run through a wall and <laughs> it turned out to be you. And That's awesome. I mean, here's what's crazy is it was one of your very first speaking gigs ever. If I remember right at the correctly. beginning. Yeah. That's no, wild. It was within that first first year. I, I mean, I can't really place it exactly. Do you remember where it was, where we would have been for it? I know it was like a regional meeting because I did a bunch of regional meetings for the, for the bank at that point. I think we were in Chicago at the time. It could have been Chicago, okay. could have been Midwest, could have been anywhere around there. <laughs> 12 years ago, kind of blends up. Yeah, we'll just keep it at the Midwest. That yes, sounds good. Yes, anywhere in the Midwest. There we go. <laughs> and um, so what's really cool is, you know, that I – I went about 10 years without bumping into you again. And we went to Lewis's event, um, Summit of Greatness, Lewis House. And you were one of the keynote speakers. And it was just like this full circle moment getting to be re-inspired by you again and reconnected to you again. And then it turned out we had mutual friends and, and were able to you know chat the night away. And God, did we even end up kind of dancing the night away, if I remember correctly? Oh, man, I think so. From what I remember, <laughs> at least the uh, the bits and pieces that uh, it all got still... it all got foggy towards the end. Foggy there, but... for a different reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's just amazing how the universe kind of worked out and, and connected us again. And you're just somebody who really, really inspires me. So I'm excited to have this conversation. Oh, I mean, it goes both ways, man. It's really cool to hear, you know, as a speaker, some of the things that I would question the most would be, you know, does this matter? Like, am I, you know, am I making a difference? It's natural. I mean, just to frame it so that everybody, you know, can understand, like everybody in the planet has like self doubts about that kind of stuff too. So to hear you say that, you know, that, that they could stay with you that many years later, it was, it was a really powerful experience for me too. I think everybody had, does have those self doubts. Well, I know they have those self doubts and, and that's something that we're going to get into in a little bit because, you know, when it comes to excuses and, and the BS stories that we tell ourselves in our head, 
man, we can just really get in a freaking way, can't we? Absolutely. And also, too, you know, I think that there's the, the positive spin on that, though, that I place is that there, to some degree, I've always had like a paranoia that I'm not making a difference and that would drive me to make a deeper difference. Right. So it as long as it stays in sort of a healthy place where it's, you know, sort of fuels you to be better, I think it's OK. But, you know, if, if we just go to that place of like, oh, yeah, cool, I've like done these things and I'm going to go and share the same story, blah, 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 and I'm super flat, then like it's not going to have an impact and then it is going to go away. And just like we were talking about kind of offline before we jumped into this, then it's, it's the same concept, right? Sometimes you get so busy that you're like, oh man, I just want some like downtime. And then you get that downtime and you're like, oh man, I'd miss it when it was busy and chaotic. So, you know, that's just the ebb and flow of life, I think. Oh man, it truly is. Speaking of the ebb and flow of life, you know, I would say most of my listeners obviously know who you are, but they probably don't know all of your accomplishments, all the, the details of your story. And when I heard you tell it at Lewis's event, I was just like reminded once again, you know, tears in my eyes and the whole nine yards of just what you've accomplished. It's so insane. So growing up, you know, you were born without arms at the end of your elbows and without legs kind of, you know, near the knees. Do I have that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so you played football, became a champion wrestler. Like you've done everything. Why don't you catch everybody up on what your journey's been? Um, <laughs> I'll appreciate that. And definitely, thankfully, still haven't done everything. I think there's like a million things I'm left to want to left to do. I feel like the best is kind of yet to come. But um, yeah, I just had awesome parents that they really um, changed my mindset, uh, you know, or just kind of helped me cultivate a mindset from the beginning of normalcy not really focusing on the disability and therefore since they didn't focus on it then it, it didn't become a big deal and I mean it was for sure at times I don't want to like paint a picture that like everything was rosy either I mean at um you know 10 years old was like probably when I was peak of like self-awareness of, of the disability and just concerned you know over what my future was going to be like and am I going to have to live at home with my mom and dad forever am I going to really have a normal job or a date or any of that and then yeah, it was pretty life changing. That same that next year was when I started playing football and wrestling, and it, you know, didn't answer those bigger questions, and I wouldn't have those answers until much later. But it, it just lo loosened the grip on that fear and doubt that I had. So, take us back to let's kind of go in your teens. You were already starting to play football. You were already starting to wrestle. Um, what was the reaction of the other kids at that age when they saw you out on the field or they saw you out on the mat? I think for the most part, the other kids were more understanding than the adults were, to be honest. It, um, I think the in the community itself, I didn't really realize this until I was older, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense that there was this sort of a natural debate as to whether or not I should be allowed to go and play. And thankfully, I had parents and coaches with big enough imaginations and big enough hearts and, and, you know, courage just to give me the chance to do it in the first place. The way I would tackle people, you know, this is also 20 years ago, so probably wouldn't have flown today. And I think people would have like protested and, and, and they'd be right in some, some degree in, in some ways. Like, um, the way I tackle people is I'd smash my helmet in your shins to bring you down. You know? <laughs> Um, in wrestling, they were saying at first, yeah, I think it's, it's pretty funny transition, but when I started 11 years old, then it was basically borderline child abuse. My mom and dad are making me do it, do it and go out there. And then I say, you know, seventh grade, eighth grade came and I learned how to abuse their children. And then, you know, by the time I was a senior in high school, then placed top 12 in the nation at the senior nationals and, um, beat the state champ from Alabama, state champ from Louisiana, won 36 varsity matches that year. So it was like, at that point, there was a very real discussion as to whether or not I was unfairly advantaged over everybody. So it kind of is a big juxtaposition from where I started. God, the oxymoron there is, is mind blowing, right? You know, here, some people would look at you on the street and say, oh, that, that poor guy, he has a disadvantage. And then the conversation turned to, wait a minute, does he have an unfair advantage? It's just perspective is such a powerful thing, isn't it? Oh, totally. And, and that, that alone too, you know, I've, I've realized now how much of my life has been, been shaped by that, not just my life, but how much of every one of our lives, like a concept that's changed my life when I learned it was, uh, the map is not the territory. So Alfred Korzybski, I believe in like 1931, he said this and, um, he was the father of 
general semantics, which is the study of language. And saying the map is not the territory, what that means is we're all mental map makers and we all walk around relating though that our map is the territory, that our map is reality, instead of realizing that it's just our map. And you know, the more we can kind of get out of our own head and, and realize that, I think, in my opinion, the, the better quality of life that we have, the more we can kind of open ourselves up to different, you know, belief systems um, and see things more for what they are. It's, it's really like uh, not like so much a glass is half empty, half full. It's just like the glass half is the glass is whatever the glass is. And then, you know, we get to kind of decide what we're going to go and do with it. So. Um, the map, you know, that most people have when they see me for the first time is probably not, you know, clearly that guy's fought an able-bodied man in the cage or climbed some of the highest mountains in the world, which ended up happening, you know, that was the territory, right? So when people would see me for the first time, they think, man, that guy's like probably going to need a lot of help for a lot of things. If I'm not traveling with somebody, if I'm just in the airport by myself, then they're going to offer that. When I was younger, that used to create more insecurity. Now I just, I'm like, you know, I, it's an opportunity to help update their map. That's incredible. I love that perspective. So you kind of mentioned it, you went on to win, uh, in ESPN SP, which is insane, but even better yet, you climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. That's wild. I mean, let me just tell you as somebody who was, was born obviously with all my limbs and, and everything working, you know, as what pe one person would classify as normal. I don't think there's such a thing as normal, but what the average person would classify as normal. I would never even think to attempt something like that. Because you were way smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What was that like? Tell us about that journey. They say there's a really thin line between tough and dumb. So, you know, it's <laughs> one of my best friends, Jeff, um, just finished 10 years with the SEAL teams here in San Diego. And, you know, one of his instructors, it's kind of a SEAL wisdom. They would always say, if you're going to be dumb, you better be hard. <laughs> so... <laughs> The, um, no, like Kili was, was awesome. It was the first big mountain that we took on. That was 2012. Um, and it was awesome. It was really, you know, just getting there was a huge fight, um, on the mountain itself was, was really brutally tough. And then I had the most amazing honor of my life of getting to go and carry the ashes of a fallen veteran. His mom asked if we would, um, carry the ashes to the summit. Corey Johnson was his name and think about Corey on a pretty regular basis. And, um, you know, it's, it was an amazing journey. And after it was done, I was like pretty beat up. It was, you know, when I'm down hiking, I'm bear crawling on all fours and, you know, it's nearly 30 mile trail. So I had custom carbon fiber shoes that I used to hike and custom crampons. Some amazing people out in Arizona, um, helped adapt these for me. And, and then, um, you know, it was kind of after that, just focused on some other things and then got led back into the mountains after I said, like, probably, you know, not sure I'm on the fence if I ever want to do another one of those again and then ended up doing a much bigger one that nobody's ever heard of. Um, so it's Mount Aconcagua. So it's the highest peak in the world outside of the Himalaya. It's in Argentina, um, kind of borders Chile. So high peak of the Andes Mountains, high peak of South America. Um, and that's so nearly 22,800 Achilles for reference is like 19,300 feet. And so we spent like four nights above the altitude of the summit of Kilimanjaro. And that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. But it was also like that summit day too was like the best day ever too. It was just kind of both, both extremes kind of fit into one and um, really a big thing for me to kind of like reawaken to you know, just get kind of, uh, that passion for adventure back after I had found myself comfortable kind of doing the same thing, delivering a lot of speeches and, you know, running my gym. Like at that point, the gym is kind of running itself, but just really kind of went for a period of time of just not really having that big thing to compel or, or push me and not knowing what it would be. And, um, then that in turn now has kind of led me in a whole other direction of, um, you know, more that led to getting to do a Nike commercial, um, and a number of other things that then more and more kind of reinforce the power of like film and narrative and all of that. And now kind of people are like, Oh, what's your next mountain? And I tell them like film and photography. 
So <laughs> kind of the non-linear things that are most interesting to me. So do you have mountains out of your system now? Are you just moving on to film and photography and, and that'll be your new rush? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's always going to be different things. I actually just did my first six scuba dives on the Great Barrier Reef um, up in uh, Aust- Australia. We did a short climb there, two-day climb, and then um, went to the Great Barrier Reef and got to do my uh, first six scuba dives up there. It was absolutely awesome. I say in the mountaineering world for me, since, you know, bear crawling it, like the view isn't always the most glamorous. My face is kind of in the dirt and the ice. It's like maybe 95% sucks, 5% beautiful. That 5% that's beautiful is awesome. With the scuba diving, it was more like the complete polar opposite, like 99.99% beautiful and like very little effort since my friends were like basically towing me around. That's incredible. You know, that's almost a good metaphor for business and, and kind of a good segue into that. You had mentioned you got tired of speaking on stages everywhere and, and that's why you sought out these mountains. A lot of people don't realize that you are one of the best, most successful motivational and, and business speakers on the circuit today. How many times a year do you speak? Oh, man. Uh, thank you for the compliment too. I don't really know what to think about that. Cause I know sometimes, you know, it's like, I'm very grateful for it and all the opportunities I go and get for it. But like the, it comes with the price too, right? It's the, uh, kind of trade off and, and that price is like just traveling and being gone and all that stuff a lot for the reasons. I think the year that we did Kilimanjaro, uh, I think I did like 110 events that year oh my God. and was just like smoked. And a lot of it too was like, you know, maybe I try to fit in at least maybe 20% or more for like schools, maybe some more other percentages, you know, kind of for veteran groups and things like that. Sometimes we do three or four in a day and I would feel like somebody had just taken a vacuum cleaner to my soul. But, um, the, uh, yeah, I think this year will be less than half of that and probably two to three times the income. I mean, that's, that's insane. You know how many people would love, because I know I have a lot of speaker friends, would love to be able to speak 100 times or even 50 times in a year. I've got totally. one buddy, his name is Seth, and he does 75 a year, and he just gets so tired out doing them. So the fact that you're able to cut it in half but make two to three times much more is, is phenomenal. Good for you, man. Now, Supply here's one, and demand. You know? Yeah, exactly. Like, here's uh, one thing that people kind of take for um, granted is when I get on an airplane and I go speak somewhere, it's rather easy. But when you do it, you have a whole different set of challenges. Paint that picture for us a little bit so people can really understand what your hustle looks like. Yeah, you know, if, like when I started, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you, like for sure. Like because when I started, I was 19 years old and I'm 32 now, so it's a little different scenario. Like, you know, it started at 19. I was a freshman in college and basically got to launch a book on Oprah and Larry King. And when I around the time that I met you and first started on, on the speaking circuit, then that was crazy because I was traveling by myself. You know, I was like kind of joke, but kind of serious that like my friends would be totally on board. Like, Oh yeah, you going to Tokyo. Sure. Yeah. I'm in. And then like, uh, anybody want to go to like Wichita, Kansas? Like, ah, (laughs) (laughs) crickets, you know, even though Wichita is awesome. Like I got, you know, like you kind of like see like a lot of hidden gems, but at the same time I'm doing it by myself and you know, just kind of, just grinding and, and doing it alone. And, and I then maybe around 2010, I think was when, uh, my childhood best friend, Joey, um, who I know you talked to a bunch and kind of maybe scheduled this too. I mean, we, um, Joey and I have been working together for almost eight years now and, um, it's, uh, it's been awesome. So we travel together a lot. Um, I've got uh, another friend, Connor, that's, uh, hired, that's kind of a, became a friend after, after I've hired him. But, um, advice I got from, uh, Tim Ferriss, I think he called it like the beer test, like never do business with someone that you aren't going to want to hang out and have a beer with. But <laughs> Connor's, uh, Connor's been awesome. And so either Joey or Connor, I'm usually traveling with them. Um, something that effect, like, you know, at periods of time, you know, I've had, um, you know, ex-girlfriends or something like that. I get the, weekly lecture from my mom to like settle down and start a family something like that. I try to like fend off, but, um, you know, if I'm dating someone or something and then it's cool cause they could come with me. 
So it's it's really it's a lot less lonely and and a lot less like dramatic and a lot less difficult than it used to be. So I'm I'm pretty just now at this point I'm extremely spoiled. Yeah, you got a good tribe around you, and like tribe is everything for success, and it's it's everything to help boost the experience, isn't it? Oh, for sure, for sure. It's all. I mean, it's entirely like you know. I think like who you share it with, and you know, we could be in kind of middle of nowhere and have the most awesome night hanging out at Applebee's or something like that. Or I could be by myself having like a, you know, five star dinner somewhere and like, ah, kind of, it, it's just, I think it's entirely about <clears throat> those relationships. And now, you know, just value those more than ever. And a lot of the travel I've been doing too, this last year, 2017, I think I traveled more than I ever have before, but so much of it was for fun. My, my friend, I mentioned, um, Jeff that, uh, was, finished his time in the Navy, got out. We actually launched a um, like swimwear e-commerce brand together too. Um, so it's been amazing, like doing like um, kind of primarily just Amazon and Shopify are like the main platforms selling on like uh, swimwear, the Loudmouth Patriot for the shameless plug. It's kind of our, our brand. It started as Sunga Life. It's like was the Brazilian swimwear, the Sunga. It's like a it's type of swimwear that I never imagined myself wearing, but Jeff... Uh, discovered it was like the main thing in brazil and went to trips there with the gracie family and the jiu-jitsu guys brought it back and um it's been a cool adventure but now it's like a business trip to go to croatia yacht week and we did mykonos and went to tokyo this year went to barcelona we all over we just did this australia trip we were in israel palestine a little bit got to go all all over to uh up in um amsterdam london so you know, not, not a terrible year. And like most of that was fun and kind of the current goal is to blur the lines between work and play as much as possible. Mm, I love that. It's a great goal for this year for sure. And it sounds like you're, you're starting to do that. You know, you talk to entrepreneurs and, and businesses everywhere. What common threads are you seeing out there lately on number one, those who are successful and number two, those who are not. Hmm. Ooh, I like that. That's a good one. Um, I think I'm pretty opinionated about this too. Oh, we want to hear them. I love it. <laughs> um, so there's a great work that the great book that summarizes this, uh, two actually that I'll throw out there, but that summarize these thoughts way better. Um, one is principles by Ray Dalio. Um, who's kind of legendary investor and on all this stuff, but like he basically lays out kind of the, the principles that he operates by basically. And, I kind of had this instinct myself with like Joey, like feeling this out, like frequently we'd have these scenarios that would arise that would be very similar decisions that we were making all the time, but they just felt different. I'm like, these really aren't that different of decisions. And I, I really am at that point now where I don't want to make a decision twice unless I want to go back and like reevaluate what my priorities, my principles really are, you know, but like once you really make a decision, like you should be able to do it. Like I think a lot of times we get stuck in, just like this busy work, feeling like we're busy, feeling like we're doing something, making these bigger decisions when in fact it's really just the same thing, you know, over and over and over again. It's like, um, so now we kind of have basically started creating these different like flow charts for some decisions that I make and like, you know, like you're like doing this interview with you kind of came through that decision tree where, um, Glad I like, passed. <laughs> yeah, I no, totally. I wouldn't have passed up, you know. I mean, it's it, and it's really primarily because like then, I mean, you're killing it, you're crushing it with the podcast, and it's cool to be able to go and reach another person's audience. But at the same time, it's also like the nature of the relationship that we had, like that clearly sets it apart. So, um, I don't know. I I heard the successful CEO share this. Um, so I didn't come up with this idea in the interest of authenticity, and basically he said. He, he explained it in the context of hiring and firing people and, um, you know, said that like he would have when he kind of got company got to a size where, you know, was, he was too busy to go and um, do interviews himself, but still wanted to go and retain that culture that they'd fought to go and create in the beginning. He said that he would have his uh, employees interview the prospective candidates and rate them on a one to 10 scale. He said that the stipulation was that you couldn't choose seven because seven was a safe number. Mm. And 
Um, you know, so if you know if you had to decide something between being a six or an eight, then it it gives a lot more clarity as to whether or not you should even consider it in the first place. I think it's way tougher. That's crazy. And um, you know, so it's like many times, you know, like and I, I'm like people are awesome, and I know people are just hustling out there. Like this is not to like discourage someone that is like starting out and you know to go and build their podcast or something like that. But like sometimes when people reach out, we have to kind of like you know, turn it down. Cause it's just like, if I just did that and, you know, wouldn't really do anything else. And, and that leads me to the point number two, which is, um, really, and this is a, a book there could be summarized by this book, Cal Newport, it's called deep work. And the whole idea here is that like increasingly as the world becomes faster and more interconnected and all those things and like people are so focused on like email and that you know instagram stories and blah 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 then there are going to be higher dividends paid to people that are are actually able to focus and do deep work and the way that he describes deep work you know or like the deep creative style work that you know whether it's writing a book or um you know editing long form content you know producing really high quality long form content, um, coming up with, you know, different ideas. If you're a consultant or something to that effect, right. Then you, you know, if you work for, for Bain or McKinsey or Deloitte and you're a consultant, then like your, your role is to basically come up with these sort of paradigm shifting ideas. And you're not paid to just go and like be in touch with people via email constantly. And that you really can't like what he talks about is sort of the, the residue that's left open when we try to go and multitask, we try to go and do more at the same time. Like he presents a lot of the like science behind the fact that like we are incredibly inefficient at that and, and incredibly ineffective, even though we think that we are, we're getting, it feels like we're getting a lot more and we're really not. So it's one of the main reasons why for me, you know, I, I pulled back a little bit from sort of like a social presence in like 2017, just to go and kind of like re like rework everything of like, you know, what, what is like, the aesthetic that I want to put out there, film and photography, if those really are my goals, like I need to be producing and, you know, creating content and like nonstop kind of learn and figure out what that aesthetic is. Cause I feel like sometimes when we just put stuff out, put stuff out, put stuff out, you get that wheel turning. It's really hard to change directions once the trains move in 200 miles an hour, you know, the semi trucks going down the highway barreling forward. Like, so that, that it just those two things. I mean, I think one principles like does something really matter to you only make that decision, like, you know, create a structure such that you're not having to go and make these same decisions all the time. And then two, um, you know, build in time just to go and, and really focus on that, like deep work where you, you are shutting everything else down and, you know, building that muscle of your mind too. I love these answers. And, and, this section of the podcast alone, I think will give people huge breakthroughs. You know, number one, you said, just make better decisions with your yeses and nos. You know, I get, you know, kind of how I'm summing it up in, in layman's terms here. Yeah. And yeah. number two, it, it sounds like you're saying do more of your soul's work. Like let's stop just yeah. doing work in order to say that we're doing something and, and let's pull back and do more of our soul's work. And that's when the good stuff comes through, isn't it? Totally. I mean, it, it really is, um, you know, it's at that point, I mean, it's like, I, I can't even describe it. Like January 29th of last year was the first time I ever picked up a camera, like a manual camera that could go and shoot, you know, kind of DSLR style. And like, you know, I could have thrown it on auto and done a photo shoot. It was the first time we did like a bigger, like a photo shoot for the brand and the sunglasses and all that stuff. And like, could have thrown it on auto and, you know, I, I was trying to learn. I didn't have a clue what shutter speed or aperture or any of those things actually meant at that point in time. And it took like 45 minutes to take that first photo. So overexposed or so underexposed at different times based on like, you know, I'm like knowing that like, oh, this wheel goes and adjusts this number. Didn't know that it was the shutter speed that it's adjusting and bringing either more light in or allowing less light in. And, you know, eventually 45 minutes later got to a point where I'm like actually taking a usable photo. Like that's pretty cool. And um, now, you know, it kind of embarrassed myself um, with the guy that's become a friend, but like um, Norman Jean Roy, like a legendary fashion photographer, I got to go and like talk camera stuff with him. And 
you know, I remember that was in March and he was like second week in March. He's like asking me like, like, oh, is your like, are you like shooting raw on this? And I pass him my camera and I swear to this day, like my buddy had like switched it to JPEG. And I'm like, ah, crap. Yeah, I told him I was and then I like wasn't like I'm like, you know, but I don't know. Anyway, like that March 24th was my birthday. I was in Belize um, uh, for a friend's wedding and stayed for the week. And my friend. Lexi and I, we stayed and just like shot like obsessively that week, just everything. And that was really like just began to learn and just shoot and shoot and shoot and knowing that I'm just going to have to take 10, 15, 20, 25,000 really crappy photos or, you know, like video clips before I got to the point where I created usable stuff. And now I feel like on the other end of that, like some of the stuff that we've shot more recently, you know, just nine, 10 months later, it's been like freaking awesome and it's been brutally tough it's been hard it's been a lot of that deep work but it's been the most fulfilling year i've ever had where are you going to take this photography and videography that that you found this new love for man i want to take it to the extreme i want to direct feature films i mean i would like braveheart had such a huge impact on my life like probably saved my life at 10 years old like because i knew my my dad would tell me these legendary stories about our ancestors fighting beside wallace and all this stuff and i'm like that's what kept me going so i want to create that for you know then this next generation that's insane okay that's badass i'm excited to see that come out what's one of the best business decisions you've ever made hmm probably like having i think i mean this is a very generic answer but having like not hesitating on having really difficult necessary conversations whether it was either letting someone go when they you know just could no longer get the job done or, or or there was other conflicts that were there um or whether it was um you know taking the time to like sit down and and talk to someone about something whether it's sort of like the larger context of like what we're doing you know, um, or also to like, you know, saying like, like be not, not afraid to say something of like, you know, constructive, like criticism and kind of all those things, you know, or, or just when maybe a personal issue would go and arise or something that effect, like just not like I've had times where I've waited to go and say things and other times where I've, I've said it, like said what I needed to say. And it, it was a lot better, even though in the short term it was hard. I find that's probably one of the things that Lori and I will struggle with once in a while, yet we're hyper conscious of, like we know when we're struggling with it and that is having those tough um, discussions with people. But what's crazy is we know that it's just one quick discussion away from everything getting infinitely better. Why do, why, totally. why do you think it's so damn tough? Like that, you know, just tearing the bandaid off is such a difficult thing to do sometimes. I think it's just against our nature, I think is, you know, like maybe due to like our biology or whatever, like, I mean, going back to hunter gatherer times, there was a, uh, a reward for, you know, comfort really in a lot of ways, right? Like you expend less energy and then you can, you know, use more energy to grow your brain and things like that, or create tools, like creating tools in a lot of ways really creates just more comfort. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and it's not that, that that's a bad thing, but I think that you know, our, our, while our brains are hardwired to go and seek comfort, then I think it can really be a, sometimes like a toxic thing if we, if we stay there too long and, and, you know, and then something that, you know, it's more comfortable in the short term to not go and address whatever it is that needs to be addressed. However, over the long haul, you're in a face way more discomfort. I think it was, um, it was Mark Twain that said like, like I've suffered terrible. No, I, I remember it was um, Montaigne, French writer, philosopher. He said, I've suffered many terrible atrocities in my life and most of which never occurred. Oh gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> it's true. We just we make up these stories in our head and, you know, we're so afraid. And we're so worried that they're going to happen. And really, it's nowhere near as bad as it ever seems. Totally. I mean, it's I think that's another thing that our, our brain does to create comfort sometimes is projects things to be much worse than they are. So we, we avoid it in the first place. I mean, it's, it's all it makes sense. And on that level, at least. So similar topic, kind of an adjacent, you wrote the book, no excuses. It was a New York times bestseller, totally smashed it. And I feel like the majority of entrepreneurs, a lot of the people listening, they make a lot of excuses that hold them back. How do they, how do these people, how can they get past their bullshit excuses? I mean, the key thing to understand is that like, 
it never ends, right? Like, and and people that are listening to this, they're inspired, you know, I mean, there are going to be people that are probably the leagues ahead of us on, on some things and, you know, maybe, you know, like in other things, then they'll compare themselves and they'll feel like they're behind or something. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's like there is no end or no summit, no top, no like I'm there to like the mountain that is excuses. I've never met anyone on the planet who's just like over their excuses. And if and if they if you see that on the outside, guarantee you go and start to go and peel back the layers of the onion and personal relationships or health or finances or whatever, then there's something going on, right? It's never ending. I think it's the first thing to go and understand, but it's also too probably one of the areas where you can get the most mileage out of like making your life better. Just looking at like, you know, taking a second to go and introspect like what for everyone that's listening here, like what, what, what are the biggest like excuses that you go and that you're making every time I go and bring that up in a speech, every time I think about that myself, you know, by pinpointing that, that I'm like, man, that's, um, you know, that's it. Like, you know, for me, a big excuse that I'll, I'll make too is like, like kind of like uh, perfection and making things better. It's kind of a big part of the reason why, like I've, you know, not put out as much content as I could have in, in this last year. But at the same time, it's like, you know, it, that perfection, when I go and do do something, it makes it better. But at the same time, if I only stay there and I don't, I don't like actually put stuff out or whatever, then it, nothing, you know, it, all that, kind of work or whatever is kind of for not it's just that I'm just like stuck in like some fear thing that is like you know sort of like manifests like with like some excuse so it's not too that like you have the freedom to go out and crush it right like you know there's no guarantee that just because of like stuff that I've done or whatever in the past like that has zero bearing on whether or not somebody's going to go and well, or not zero bearing, but like little bearing on whether or not somebody's going to go and watch my content I go and put out now there's no guarantee that it's going like, to you know, go and work. And that's, that's the kind of the beauty of it is like no excuses truly at its core is not like, you know, you just go and send it and like, you know, you're going to, it's going to work out every time. No, it's the freedom to try. It's the freedom, you know, to be someone that spends, you know, a decade, two decades in the POW camp that like, you know, tugs against the rope every day, right? Like on a physical leash, but they go and like, they're not going to relent. They're not going to stop. They're not going to go and, and be contained by that environment. It's like not just a go with the flow thing. I think it's, you know, sort of at least my belief that life is better. And it's like it's a big part of our role as human beings just to tug against that leash. I totally agree with you. You know, speaking of the content that you put out, you are a highly, highly paid speaker. And matter of fact, you said this year you're going to speak half the time and, and make two to three times more um, than you did when you're speaking 100 times a year. And we talk a lot about money on this show, particularly, yeah. p particularly under the premise of when good people make good money, they do great things. So what are your thoughts on that statement? When good people make good money, they do great things. I, I couldn't agree more on it. I mean, it's just really the, the, the truth is, I mean, there are some awesome, awesome speakers out there on, on the market. But I hear some stories where I'm like, other people, people that, you know, make as much or more than I would, and then just like crazy how little value they, they try to, like they end up providing. And that to me blows my mind. And it's like, frankly, you know, I know both of us are pretty competitive, but at the same time, it's like, sometimes like other people just set the bar so damn low that like, you know, it's sometimes easy to go and like knock it out of the park if you just like show up, you're like a good person and you have like a heart to go and impact people. Like to me, I don't judge the metric of like my speaking career and success anymore around the idea of like the income that I can go and, and draw from it. I mean, that that's one way to go and measure it and certainly is like one of the metrics that goes into like my decision making process of, of whether or not I'm going to go and take on an event or not. But you know, there's, there's a whole kind of multitude of things with that. And like a big factor too, is like for me, like the biggest, the biggest thing I go and draw from, not like comment cards of like, how well do you rate the speaker, blah, blah, blah. It's more like, like your, like your story, like you saying like, man, like I, I heard Kyle speak 12 years ago or whatever. And like that really impacted me still. And it's like that, that's cool. Like, you know, someone saying like, you know, that they, they did this thing different because they were there at a speech, like 
you know, I hear that years later and I'm like, man, that is freaking cool. You know, that gets me fired up, provides more purpose to what I'm doing, makes me even more hungry to go and reach more people. And, you know, that's another thing too, with the scalability of like video and stuff like that. My uh, guy, Connor, I hired had reached out and sent an email to my website like probably five years ago or something like that. And, um, Joey got it, forwards it to me. <clears throat> it was still sitting in, you know, in my inbox. I remember like having read it, but like kind of a lot of things I just, you know, I, sometimes I can be a little bit like introverted recruits, recruits, right? So I, I read it and like, we didn't talk and then randomly connected like four and a half, you know, years later. And, you know, he said that like the in speaking intro video that I would use, it was just random, you know, didn't have a huge view count or whatever on YouTube. It was just kind of sitting out there. He said that that video had this huge impact on him. And it's cool now. We're like, you know, working on creating this stuff together to go and like reach other people. And it's, I, I don't know, kind of like going a lot all over the place here. But like people, when I started speaking, a lot of the, and I wanted to go and like raise like my fee, you know, once I realized that I was like making a, you know, a fraction of what these other keynote speakers were that was on the same sort of circuit with. And I was like, I got a lot of pushback from it. And people were like, oh, you're gonna price yourself out of the market. Oh, you haven't like done any major media recently to go and justify that. And I, I cre created a lot of like nervousness in me to go and raise my prices. And I was like, finally, like, screw it. Like, we're gonna go and do it. You know, Joey and I were partnered together and like, let's just see what happens. And then we did it and you know, did it a few times. It kind of like just raised it incrementally at first and then ended up like basically doubling it, tripling it. It was like all of a sudden, like, you know, years later, this is what wasn't like immediate. It was, you know, sort of every six months or so we'd stop and reevaluate where we're at. And then like, you know, I feel like I get less pushback for my fee now than I did when I started. And it was like way less because it's like, and also too, I, I don't, you know, negotiate really anymore. If like, if you, if someone doesn't want to go and like pay that, then it's like, it's awesome. And I hope that you guys have an awesome event. It, it's just not going to be worth my time to go and invest, to go and do it. And we've had situations where people are like, you know, we just don't have the budget for it. We don't want it. We want the relationship to go and work. And so we're like, cool. Like, you know, we've had groups that ended up making really sizable donations to nonprofits that, that I work closely with and like end up overall having a higher fee than my typical fee and like that creates kind of a win-win scenario too and like it's not just about like more money with that it's, it's just about the fact that like no like if I'm gonna go and put my time in with that either you know me directly or something I care about directly will benefit from having participated in this you know Kyle a lot of people really get hung up on asking what they're worth and, and I think you just sharing that story how you struggled with it at first and, and how some people even tried you to dissuade you from doing it, but you did it anyways. And, and now everything's, you know, you're kind of in the flow even better than when you were pricing yourself low. I think that's a great example of how important it is for us to stand up for what we know we're worth. Have you found that you're, you're getting a better quality of opportunities now that you've raised your fees and you've kind of eliminated some of the riffraff or the, uh, the troubles that you've had before when you were... oh totally 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 I mean yeah I mean there's there's so many examples I mean, like it in a different context I'll, I'll explain it so like I remember kind of did a similar thing with my gym you know so I started my gym um it's kind of my dream just go and start a gym I had a visions of this like big gym and then it was around you know when the market tanked in 2008 like speaking kind of like dried up a little bit, you know, it's like one of the first things on the light item that like is easy to go and scratch off the list. So I was like kind of bored. <laughs> what am I going to do now? And started my gym and just kind of started with a 2000 square foot spot. And then we knocked the wall down to 3000 square feet and then ended up, you know, expanding to a 12,000 square foot spot. And I've got way better people managing the gym for me now than, than I was ever as, as a manager. And um, and it's awesome. And, you know, kind of created a structure where they can go and help share in the growth and profits of it, too. And, you know, now kind of like don't really do a whole lot of work to go in. And before it's kind of was just more turnkey. It's it's kind of running itself at this point. Um, but when I started and I remember Greg Glassman, who founded CrossFit, he was kind of one of my early mentors and especially in the gym world. And he 
I remember hearing him speak one time when he said, you know, the, the people that you make these barter deal with, with like, hey, uh, you know, come like re-roof my house and I'll give you six months free or something like that, you know, or like, <laughs> uh, you know, hey, come be our photographer or something like that and like, you know, take some photos for us and then, you know, we'll give you a super discounted rate like that. Those kind of deals ended up being the biggest headaches. And as soon as you get rid of those kind of deals, you're way better off. Now, sometimes, granted, if it's like a close friend or something and you want it to go and work out, I'm not saying don't do that, but it's more so like to kind of have that be like the rule instead of, you know, you, you want that to be the exception. You don't want that to be the rule where you're just like bartering to go and try to like get by like, oh, you know, my fees, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, whatever, like all over the place. But like, I'll take 3,000. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, you can't do that. And then, you know, what what it creates too is really, I mean, it creates a lack of confidence for you to be able to go and ask for that in the future. It also, you know, you know subconsciously that like deep down, you're not providing a significant difference between somebody that pays you 3,000 versus 30,000 or something, right? So it's like, if that's the case and that's kind of the spectrum that you have, then like, ah, you know, you kind of, like you, I think you're doing yourself a huge disservice and, and a disservice to, to like the people that are willing to go and like pay your actual fee and like in the groups there and those opportunities. I mean, people, don't, we don't often think about the trade offs of like when we commit to one thing, right? Then there is that inherent trade off to another. We kind of, we, we, we get that, but like on like a macro scale with our time, like, Time's the only thing that we don't get back. So those those things that we say yes to, they better freaking be things that we, we want to go and commit to. And, you know, I think the more value we see in ourselves and the value we're providing for, for the people that we work with, then the easier it is to go and ask for those those kind of rates and fees. I couldn't agree more. Just a couple of real quick uh, questions left for you here, Kyle. Um, I know you're now that you've been really successful, you're equally generous as you are successful. And so what cause or causes do you care the most about and which causes should we be more aware of out there? Um, right now there, so there are a few groups that I'm like really close with and kind of in, in, um, for different reasons in different ways. So I'm a board member of two nonprofits. One is the K2 Adventure Foundation, that, which helps kids with disabilities and families with disabilities kind of around the world. Um, and uh, it's an awesome organization, basically the group that I climb with for instance, at the base of Kilimanjaro, there's an orphanage there that we support where there's um, about 150 kids with disabilities that are like, at the school that are orphaned that are, you know, in East Africa. And like if you're born with a disability there, especially if you're like blind or albino, like most of the kids there, then you're kind of screwed in a lot of ways. You know, it's like sometimes like there's this tribal belief that like, you know, your family was cursed and all this stuff and like you get kicked out of the village and um you know, there's really some like kind of old tribal like thinking that's that's pretty brutal. And um, that these kids at the school now end up like they're um, they're outperforming many, many other kids. In fact, like, you know, when they have resources, that's become one of the larger like medical centers in the community um, dental center. It's kind of helped create a more sustainable funding model for the school. We've got this big tilapia farm there and like a number of other things. But the, the school I just heard, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm like 99% sure that we're like the second highest performing school in the country in Tanzania. So these kids with disabilities that previously like kind of like didn't have an opportunity, now they do. And it's awesome. So that's the K2 Adventure Foundation. Um, Runway for Dreams is an organization that I, I serve on the board of now too. Just recently accepted a position there, but it's um, you know, really, the goal is to um, kind of infiltrate the fashion community and create like um, for people with disabilities and in particular with kids um, and to um, you know, kind of create like more like a community that's like centered around like accessibility with clothing, you know, whether it's like just different adaptive stuff, you know, magnetic buttons and things like that, that are functional, that, that, that look cool too. Oh, um, that's awesome. And, that's a brilliant. Idea. Yeah. It's really cool. And stuff that like, you know, you think is like, oh man, it's kind of a no brainer. It should have existed a long time ago and it hasn't. And, um, you know, it's, um, 
amazing founder and, and, and she just has this amazing story. Her son was, um, uh, was born with muscular dystrophies and like, you know, and she watched it would take him so long to get dressed, even with his, with her help. And, you know, just, um, now it's, it's kind of this mission to go and make that way easier. And also to, you know, one of my favorite aspects of it is, is really the awareness piece to go and just change the way that people view people with disabilities and, and like see people with disabilities in more like mainstream fashion things. Um, and then the, the next one too, that we work really closely with is the honor foundation. So, um, best buddy, Jeff, like Navy SEAL friend, he participated in the honor foundation. He was the fifth class to go through. Um, they, uh, basically it provides 120, the honor foundation provides 120 hours of executive MBA classroom time, executive MBA level coaching for, um, special operators. So special operations guys in, in the military primarily. So you have in the Navy, Navy SEALs, uh, SWIC, the boat guys, you have Intel, um, you have in the Marines, MARSOC, you know, Army Delta, uh, you know, those sort of special operator groups. Now those guys basically go through this, you know, 240 hours of, of executive level MBA experience and then kind of get in this pipeline that's kind of this created this community now several hundred i think we're at like over 300 almost 400 operators have gone through the program and you know now you get sort of like in, infiltrated like all of the cool areas of the world and like tech and you know any top company like you know from you know kind of linkedin to airbnb and like all this cool stuff you know like i uh, you know like you've got these, you know, Navy SEALs that are now kind of like helping run, run these, these teams. And, you know, the organizations benefit greatly also too, by having the leadership experience and, you know, the, the veterans gain so much by learning the language of, um, of business and not just like getting, you know, like to work for these companies too, but we, like now it's a, there's a, a soft garage. So like special operators, like, uh, entrepreneur or like garage basically like to go and like help guys get um funding for a startup or you know down just kind of like mentorship in their startups uh you know and and sort of specialize like whether they're doing e-commerce stuff there's a guy that just like launched this um you know awesome new brewery here in um in san diego i think protector brewery so the um there's just some really cool stuff happening with that and um there's a couple of other groups that i work closely with that i won't go into now, but the, those are kind of the big three that we've chosen to really try to make a difference with. Man, Kyle, I love your giving heart and, and I love the impact that you're making. So real quick, what is one of your favorite all time moments of giving? And, and we asked this question to every single guest just to inspire other people to like, you know, become more aware of these little opportunities that they could be making an impact on a regular basis. Do you have one that stands out to you? Um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are definitely a few, I mean, there's, it's kind of like, you know, I, I like really, it's so, it's like ubiquitous almost like, you know, it's like basically everything that we take on, we want to go and have one of my mentors, Ted Leonsis, he was the first uh, chairman, vice chairman of AOL. And it was like really cool to be vice chairman of AOL. He's an amazing guy. He always talks about like having a double bottom line with everything that you do, you know, purpose and profitability. So it's like, it is very intertwined. So it's kind of hard to pick like different, like a favorite moment, but I would say, you know, thinking outside of the box and thinking like, all right, even not just like having given directly, although, I mean, that is really fun too, but like, I like thinking, okay, how can I go and take, you know, an abstract idea, say I'm giving the speech for this organization or something like that. And like in this division, they don't have the budget to go and do it. Say it's the marketing department that's putting on this event or something like that. Right. And they can only draw so much from the budget there. And then, you know, but they do have funds inside of this, uh, you know, give corporate giving account that they, you know, if like the right person asked to go and, you know, have something there, they can go and, and draw from those funds. Now, you know, and this is credit to Joey, he's been amazing at, at really executing with this, but we can basically create something where it's sort of like a hybrid fee, right? So it's like, um, you know, that basically, uh, you know, some portion of the fee is going to go to, you know, this nonprofit, some portion of the fee is going to go towards our business, our bottom line. So, you know, I'm looking at right now, um, it's really cool. Like for the Honor Foundation was like 
maybe six months ago was awarded like a really cool honorary paddle, like a, like a paddle with like a boat kind of paddle um, and kind of cool, you know, right up on there about like what it means and all this. But like it was just sort of a thank you for, you know, we raised, um, you know, in, in just a couple of months, raised $20,000 for that organization just off of that idea. So, you know, it's like that kind of stuff I love. It's like it creates a, a win for the group that wants to come in, come in and have a speak. And, you know, they're able to go and do it in a different way. It creates a win for us to be able to go and, you know, in our bottom line, to be able to go and draw a fee, which is still significantly larger than when it, where it started out. And then also creates an opportunity to go and give back to this organization that we really, truly believe in the work that they're doing. So, um, you know, we've done that a number of times now. And it's like, it, it's awesome. And it's just it doesn't have to be, oh, I'm, I'm giving this directly. No, like think outside of the box and like what skills and tools do you have to leverage to be able to go in then and make a difference. God, that's brilliant. That's inspiring. I love it. So before I ask you the very last question, where can we find you? Because I want everyone to go follow you, see what you're up to, support your causes, check out all the new photography that's going to be coming out and, and everything else that you do. Where's the best place to find you? Um, Probably, I mean, just, you know, I think just type my name in the, in the Google, um, you know, Kyle Maynard. If people want to see some videos, there's some videos on there that are not the ones that I've put out yet, but just, uh, but they will be soon. Just Kyle Maynard in the YouTube. Um, and I'm on Instagram at Kyle Maynard, probably one of the more active ones. I've got sometimes I'll lurk on Facebook, but I think generally kind of keep up with each other. Like see you and, and Lori crushing in on Instagram and, and, and doing awesome there. So it's been fun to see you guys have such awesome, you know, similar messages, but different too. And like kind of have you both be able to go and, and be out there and creating that, you know, just amazing community. Like I, I was on, you know, recently on your page, just like reading some of the comments that people were leaving and stuff. I was like, man, it's so freaking cool. So it's, it's awesome. I, I'm just really stoked to, to be friends with, you know, with, with you and, um, excited to be able to go and spend t more time with Lori too. And, you know, I guess when you just see Lewis next time, tell him I said hello too. So we were uh, just with him last night. I'll, I'll have to shoot him a no text way. afterwards. Yep. Yeah. I awesome. actually told him that it's going to interview you today because we had a brunch planned and I said, Hey, can't make it interviewing Kyle. So awesome. Awesome. Well, we could have done that and just had like post mimosa interview. <laughs> <laughs> Might've been a whole different conversation. We'll do that hey, one I, <laughs> by the way, I don't want that to go by without me saying thank you. Thank you for the kind words. It, it's an absolute privilege to be able to make a difference in the world alongside of you. And, you know, I'm just excited to, to watch both of our journeys unfold. That's for sure. So very last question, I know you got to go, is this. Why should people be unapologetic about their pursuit of success and or wealth? Oh, man. Woo. That's, that's a good one. You know, <laughs> the first thought that comes to mind is I think we take, like, especially in the world today, we take sometimes like this world and this life way too serious at moments, which in turn has this kind of like white knuckle grip life and like, you know, Oh, it's gotta be this way. It's gotta be that way. And we kind of forget that we're like on this like magical spinning spaceship that's traveling through the universe at like 60, 60 or 70,000 miles an hour. But yet we're just like barely a blip of a blip of a blip of a blip on the radar of like the grand scheme of things. I mean, they're, you know, are more stars in the sky than there are like, uh, you know, grains of sand on this planet by like an order of like 10, you know, <laughs> we're like, it's wild. We think, like, we think that we're so special. We might not even be the smartest creatures on our own planet. Once we figure out like sperm whales, humpback whales, all this have like more developed language than we do. So, you know, it's like to begin, I think it's like, we just got to get over ourselves and realize like, it's not that big of a deal. I'm like 51% convinced that we're kind of living in some like, you know, VR video game anyway. So like, if that's the case, then like freaking send it, you know, go out, do it. Like if you go and wake up and you're in some arcade at the end, then like you're going to be pissed off that you didn't take more risk, that you didn't try hard, you didn't do something different. And I'm not, that's not to say that there's not real suffering in the world. Very, very familiar and attuned with that. It's just more a matter of like, you know, take ourselves a little less seriously and have some more adventure, fun risk, like, and then see what happens. I've never, ever, ever seen someone that like does that gets knocked down, gets back up. And if you get up enough times, like you're going to get to the other side eventually. 
Dude, I couldn't agree more. Kyle, this is the best answer. And I love the 51% possibly in this weird game. Who knows? You <laughs> might as well give it your best. Oh, That's thanks, one of the best yeah. answers I've ever gotten. <laughs> Man, I listen, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your friendship. And I just make, I can't wait to see what we're doing one year and five years and 10 years from now. Totally, man. Awesome. I'm, I'm stoked too. All right, my friend. Thank you so much. Super grateful. We'll have you on again in the future. Sounds good. Talk to you soon, bud. All right. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.